Hello, my name is Wendy Potomsky and I'm the managing partner and owner of Retake Furniture Rentals. Retake is once again a proud supporter of the Canadian Film Festival and is working to contribute to the Canadian film and TV industry by making it an easy and sustainable place to do business. Retake provides sustainable short and long-term furniture rental options to meet production schedules and product needs. Retake also understands the importance of set design and the dynamic nature of the film and TV industry, which is why we created a company to specifically support Canadian filmmakers. Retake can assist you in setting up your production office with sustainable alternatives to keep your team working safely as we all head back to work. We use sustainable approaches to minimize product going to landfill, which means any product supplied by Retake is helping to support the circular economy. Our in-house upholstery services can tailor our product to meet your set design requirements and match your color schemes. Contact us to discuss your office furniture needs. Our goal is to help you get back to work as safely and efficiently as possible. Stay safe everyone and enjoy the films and shorts at this year's Canadian Film Festival. Celebrate Canadian filmmakers on Super Channel Fuse with an exclusive homegrown event. I'm ready. Go. The Canadian Film Fest presented by Super Channel brings this year's festival into your home for a second year as a virtual experience. Goodbye. Every Thursday, Friday and Saturday night until April 18th, enjoy the premieres of indie films and shorts from critically acclaimed and up-and-coming Canadian producers and directors. And this is where the donkey starts talking. Cut. Immerse yourself in this inspiring and spirited event, both on air and online, with live Facebook Q&A sessions that follow the films. Makes sense. Start it. Experience the Canadian Film Fest, proudly presented by Super Channel. Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining us and welcome to the Q&A for the Canadian Film Fest screening of Women in Car, preceded by the short film, The Pond at Night. My name is Laura Good and I'm one of the programmers here at SIF. And I'm Mark Ishodia and I'm also one of the programmers here. And we do have the cast of Women in Car, including the director and cast members joining us, Vanya Rose, Aidan Ritchie, and Elaine Joy. Helene Joy, excuse me. Uh, but first we're gonna hear from our short filmmaker, Olivia Boudreau. Hi, Olivia, thanks so much for joining us. Hello, thank you for having me. Thanks for being here. I might start off by asking you a little bit about the genesis of the inspiration for your film, The Pond at Night. What inspired it and how did it come into being? Um, well, it, it was three different desire. Uh, I wanted to film uh, in a pond at night because I was uh, very uh, attracted by the, the sound and texture and colors of uh, this kind of environment. And I wanted to, um, to film a very long monologue. And I wanted to work with two, uh, two women, two sisters and their um, relationship, their affinities. So it was like three different things that at some point just, I don't know, became the pond. Uh, and uh, it was a very um, sudden, <laughs> it was a very sudden mise en forme, like everything at some point just uh, went easily and I had this script. That's great. Um, the the two performances from the characters are really what grounds the film. Can you tell us a little bit about how you found how you found those actors and how they got involved with the project? Uh, Evelyne de la Chenelière is a friend of mine. Uh, we're currently writing a feature uh, feature movie together, and I wanted to work with her spe specifically. It was written for her. Uh, she's a very well-known actress here in Quebec and a playwright as well. And I felt like uh, I wanted to, we don't cast her in this type of role normally. And I wanted to find this voice in her that I, I know that she, she has because she has a very wide range. Uh, so I started with Evelyn and then I was looking for her sisters uh, her sister and I, I did some casting and it was very uh, magical when Noemi uh, came by because they have the same delivery 
the same um, sophisticated presence, energy, like soft and, and I don't know, and, and inhabited. Uh, so they, they were a, a great match. Okay. I'd love to also ask you about the film's aesthetic sensibility. It's really rich from a formalist perspective mm -hmm. and it's got this, this beauty about it that really allows for reflection in the blurred lines between imagination and memory, particularly that ending and you know the the veil of darkness that's falling with twilight and this lush cinematic space that the film operates within how did you arrive at the film's visual sensibility and, and what came first sort of that vision which you had kind of talked about a little bit as the sense of place in the conversation or the actual subject matter because it it is it does dovetail very much with that dark complex subdued vibe that you give visually yeah they were like two different track uh like the pond was amazingly visual and uh i'm i'm first and foremost i'm a visual artist so i'm 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 like entering my project through uh visual aesthetic colors and texture and and soundscape and um and the, the monologue was something else, but suddenly the, 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 this beautiful environment, uh, so peaceful, was perfect for this kind of, uh, of, of dialogue with something so um, difficult to grasp and raw and, and, and violent. Uh, so I felt that the, the pound was the perfect place to, to, to have this conversation uh, because it was balancing the, it was a, a beautiful contrast, but also it was easier to, to, to follow it. Um, yeah, it was helping a little bit. That's great. Um, we have a question here from James about the locations. Can you talk about, you know, the locations are really a huge part of um, what adds to the atmosphere of the film and especially that final shot is so amazing. Can you talk about where those locations are and how you found them? Uh, it's in Abercone. It's uh, one and a half hour and a half south of Montreal. And um, the, the movie was written for another pond, <laughs> but I, I couldn't shop there. And by, I don't know, this incredible chance, we, we had this, uh, this family that, had, uh, that have a cottage at Abercorn with, with a private pond. And it was, it was amazing. It was amazing because you walk from the house, like maybe 10 minutes, uh, and then you're in the forest and it's their private pond. So it was a beautiful location. Uh, I mean, all the all the the crew would feel like I don't know this beautiful summer days and a beautiful location, and it was it was a yeah amazing place. Definitely, and I'm sure you were working with natural light from what we're seeing, unless you had the most sophisticated, incredible lighting team I've ever experienced. Yeah. 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 It's natural light, and I wanted uh, I wanted to start the movie like at at the end of the day, like just before the the light comes down, and and end it at the night. I, I wanted like the timeline of the movie to be this uh, this kind of, of uh, déroulement, uh, and so it was very uh, it was a very rush shooting because we had only two days, and we were always like pushed by the light. Uh, but yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's impressive. Mm -hmm. And I also wanted to dig in a little bit to the film's thematics specifically. Mm -hmm. It's so rare to me as a female programmer, I'm, I'm very much inundated with representations of sexual assault, rape culture, and it's such an important conversation, but this to me felt like it was handled very differently and was very um, refreshing and unique in its perspective. And then it does absolutely lay bare rape culture and the complicity that allows it to continue. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also not in any way exploitative and it just felt like it struck such a nuanced and complex note. And how did you go about that in 
on a script level and developing that from the page onto the screen? Um, and how, how did you talk about those nuances with your cast and navigate that? Mm. Um, it was it was very, uh, I, I mean, these are very important subjects and it was, and I wanted to address that, but it was in no way possible for me to show it. And I don't felt that it was a good way to bring people in these kind of question by showing it in their face. I, I, and also because it's a violence against women or anyone, it's something that is most of the time very difficult to grasp. That is, uh, that, that is so many perspectives on one event and it's, and the memory is something that is very evasive. And so it's, I, I mean, the nature of these events are so complex that I, I, I was looking for a way to, to talk about it um, with great distance, but, but still um, with precision, with to it being very precise, precise about it. So uh, I, I was, I developed this, this story and I wanted it to feel that um, the spectator, the spectator wouldn't be, would have doubt about the woman herself telling the story and about the story. And even the character has doubt about what she heard and what she seen. And uh, when she has the question, uh, does, does people see what I see or hear what I hear? I, I, I think it's, um, it's very, uh, it's that, that's how we feel uh, in front of um, power dynamics. And, and it's always difficult to point it in a very precise way, yeah. Absolutely. And I felt that was very self-reflexive in the film itself mm -hmm. in those final moments where the camera sort of loses one of the sisters momentarily into the darkness. And you're sort of wondering if some of that monologue was real or imagined, or if these characters are still in this space. Mm -hmm. And um, I just thought that was really beautifully executed as a way to close the film and to have us as viewers question our own experience and our own memory of what we've just seen on screen was that really something awesome. that was yeah. yeah was that something that was intentional for you yeah yeah I, I i i mean it's it's mostly the nature of my work it's always to find the 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 blur between like uh the, the psychic and the and the physical world and the dream and the reality and the, i'm very interested in perception the way we perceive and interpret and and what what contaminates it and and so it was uh it was a very um i don't know the pound was a very amazing playground for that it was it was permitting so many things amazing so I think we're just about out of time. Um, we want to thank you again for sharing your film with us. It's really, you know, an amazing piece of work. Thank and so uh, we're going to be right back with our feature filmmakers. Um, so stick around for everyone tuning in. And thank you, Olivia. We'll see you around. Thank Thanks, you, Olivia. Pleasure having you. Thank you so much.
Hi everyone, welcome back to the Canadian Film Fest Q&A. We are now returning with the cast and director of Women in Car. I'm gonna start off by introducing Vanya Rose, the director who's gonna introduce her cast. Hi Vanya. Hi, how are you? Well, thank you for being here. How are you? Thank you, good, yes. I was just saying that I was watching the film just before and so I'm all flustered. <laughs> but anyway, um, and so joining us is Helene Joy who plays Anne and Aidan Ritchie, who plays Owen. Hi, thanks for being here. Thank you. Pleasure. I might actually start the conversation with your casting of Aidan and Helene, because oh. the performances are so absolutely remarkable and really ground this film. Um, and it's such a showcase, I think, for these two actors. Could you speak a little bit about how you came to find them to embody the roles of Anne and Owen? And then maybe we could hear from Aiden and Helen as well, Helene, um, as to what that journey was like and what drew you to the roles. So actually both of them, oddly enough, um, I literally saw a picture this big of each of them. Okay. And that's how I cast them, literally. It's, wow. it's embarrassing to say, but that's literally how it happened. I had no clue who Lane Joy was. Um, and I saw this tiny picture. I was doing this project at CFC at the time for the film, um, very early on. It was, a, you know, totally very beginnings. And we had to do this little project and the casting agent gave us this big book. And I looked for hours in this room by myself and I saw this tiny little picture. And I said, I think that's her. I think, I think that's her. And they were like, that's Helene Joy. And I was like, you know, I'm from Quebec. I have no clue who this person is. And from there on, it just kind of, we met up and, and it was perfect. It was love at first sight, what can I say? And then for Aiden, it was exactly the same thing. It was a few months before we shot the film and I had been recommended all these kind of up and coming Canadian actors, but you know, no one was, how can I put it? Just no one was hot enough. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't find anyone who really like affected me, you know, that I, I saw and I was like, affected in any way whatsoever. And so I actually hurt my back. This is gonna be such a long story, I'm so embarrassed. I hurt my back and I was in bed and I said, okay, today I'm finding this actor, I don't care. And so I basically gave myself, the baby was sleeping and I gave myself four hours to find him. And I was going through this website and I basically got to R and landed on Aiden's picture, again, this big. And I said, I think that's him. And that was it. And then he sent me a little recording and then I said okay he's perfect and he, you know he'd done just a few things and barely had an agent and <laughs> was in Winnipeg in snow land and, yeah. and that's it and that's how I cast them both. Well there is something to be said I mean it's a visual medium with form and you know the emotion and emotional response triggered by an image so it doesn't sound think, so crazy. And I think photos I think you know yeah I think photos say a lot about I mean we can kind of you know read people to a certain extent. And I think I could just, you know, eyes, eyes say it all, I guess, in a way. Uh, Do you want to speak next as to what drew you to the role when you first read the scripts? Uh, uh, yeah, um, sorry, the question is about the script or the casting or the, the whole thing. Oh, yeah. Just what drew you to the role and however that came about? Yeah, I mean, it's always, as an actor, it's always the writing that, draws you to a role I mean when we first met I hadn't really we hadn't I hadn't seen it I don't think even or maybe I had I can't remember exactly but you know I just got a call someone wants to meet you and we met up and and uh we talked about it and I think I hadn't I don't think I'd read much of it at that point but I was we, nothing written what's that there was nothing written it was just a scene <laughs> it, was about, it was about a scene or two and it was like terribly like, totally different but it was about a scene or two I had I think right and we discuss it a lot and I just, I mean the role sounds amazing and it is amazing it's amazing role I mean any actor get excited about a, a role that's so complicated and uh so emotional and all of the things we love to do um and and then we we went ahead and did a short film in the meantime and so that sort of solidified things and then we you know then it was really just about how do we get this film made <laughs> and that became the journey but but yeah, I think it's really funny about the, I mean, it was so long ago that I think you were looking through work, casting workbook used to do it with a book. I mean, that doesn't happen anymore. And that's what you would have seen it in. Yeah. That's yeah. really funny. <laughs> and so, uh, 
so it happened to be right but who knows why or how and um but yeah in the end the you know the role and her journey it's it's fun to sink your teeth into something just so you know deep and and there's really you can you don't have to limit how deep you can take it whether the audience knows about what you're doing or not it just had all the you know it had it, it had the depth and breadth if you will to to give you tons to play with which it's always fun and Aiden can you talk a little bit about yeah how you came to it and and what your reaction to you reading about your character was uh well um I didn't know what to think of the whole the whole thing because Danny had just randomly like I was in between agents so she randomly messaged me like on Facebook and you know it was like I want you to audition for this movie and I was like all right sure why not and then when she like said yeah we we want you to be in this I didn't even I didn't know what to think but you know, part of me was like, this can't be real. Like, you know, I'm, I'm from Winnipeg. Yeah. It's <laughs> you know, how did they hear about me? You know, but uh, I read the script and, and it, it, it uh, just really, really, really made me hungry to, to tell this story. Um, you know, uh, it, it, it's, it's a really amazing script. I think that Vanya wrote um, that uh, as Elaine said, any actor is just going to, just bite right into it because there, there's so much uh, layers to what's going on in, in, in the narrative, you know, and as, as some of you may know, Vanny loosely based it on the reef, which um, in my opinion means that, you know, it's got to be good if it's based on a novel from that era, like, you know, yeah, I, yeah so I, I, I just was so hungry to tell, plus I was playing a musician, you know, like playing a a piano player. I'm not a piano player, but I did learn a little bit for hmm. for this for this uh, for this role, and I do, you know, have have a, a you know a lot of music in my in my uh, blood. So it it really turned me on, you know, and uh, and then you know meeting the cast like Lane and Leanne and Gabrielle and Anthony uh, just made me more excited because everybody was just wanting to tell the story, you know, in every way that we, 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 we can, you know, really dig into the characters, dig into this, the, the uh, situations, the themes, the romance. It was, it's, uh, it is true. Elaine's right. It's any actor's dream to be in a movie like this. Yeah. The, um, what, what I like about it so much is the dramatic layout of it is so great, you know, and the tension between, what Owen is demanding and what Charlotte is demanding and sort of the fact that Charlotte knows about their secret, but it, it, the, there's also a theme there of, you know, keeping up appearances and the image of the family and stuff like that. So Vanya, I would love for you to talk a little bit about, you know, Owen mentioned the reef. I mean, sorry, Aiden mentioned the reef. Um, talk a little bit about um, how much you took from that, but also what your writing process was like over the course of putting the script together? So originally it was actually quite close to the novel. Um, it was actually a period film. It was, um, and it was, yeah, it was, it was quite close. Like I was, it was, it was supposed to be an adaptation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then as time went by, I just kind of got further and further away from it. It became contemporary. I mean, that obviously changed a lot, but I mean, basically all that's really left are these names, I guess. And most of all, um, what interested me was Edith Wharton, who had, um, you know, grown up and remained in the very old bourgeoisie of New York City. Um, and she continuously wrote about it. If it be, you know, Age of Innocence, which Scorsese um, adapted. Um, and she continuously questioned it um, in all of her works. She's, I mean, she's just a brilliant author. And The Reef is a very, I mean, if anyone, you know, it's a brilliant novel to read because it's so so contemporary, you know, also it's about um, an affair that someone has, and, but it's totally different. I mean, the stepson is a stepson. There's no piano, there's no archery. There's none of this, you know, this is all, this all came, came after the fact, but there are these characters and there's this kind of setting, which interested me because I just felt like in Montreal, we have this West Mount, um, which is a neighborhood where, you know, before the um, silent revolution here, we had, um, 
uh, you know, like the six banks of Canada were here. It was a very wealthy, you know, we were the center of Canada basically. And then when that happened, you know, it all moved to Toronto. Everyone just fled and went to Toronto. But at that one point, Montreal was kind of the center of all the money of, uh, of Canada. And so we have this kind of historical kind of setting in Montreal where, you know, money, you know, <laughs> used to be and still is and these huge houses from the turn of the century, you know, these massive houses. And so it was an area that I wanted to explore and having read the book and I just kind of, it just kind of went all, got all, you know, I put the pieces together and then just kind of went, then just went off on my own with my own imagination. And the stepson obviously became something very different than what he is in the book. And, mm -hmm. yeah. and but it was definitely the, you know, the beginning. Yeah. And just to expand on that, what do you think it was that was the core that spoke to you when with all of these sort of more superficial aspects aside, like time period and, and sense of place, which isn't necessarily superficial, but which was changed. Um, and, and then what was it that held your interest and made you feel, I have to tell this story? Was it the relationship between the two characters, the complexity of the characters themselves? Or, or just the thematic? There was, no, there was no relationships as in the film. Like, um, the relationships are totally different. What interested me was the actually the main thing was actually what the title is, which is the reef. And if you notice in the film, we built a lot of water into the film. If you listen, if you have like your headset on, you really, or if you're in a theater, which one day hopefully it will be, but there's a lot of water in there. And um, there was, you know, there's this idea in the novel, which is this thing that you, um, an experience that you have or someone that you spend time with and that you, um, that you just can't get over. And so Edith Wharton used this metaphor of the reef, which was this idea of this block, you know, like a ship trying to pass a reef and can't get past that reef. So similarly, as you know, humans, we get ourselves into situations if we view the person or a situation and we just can't get over them. And so I think that idea really stuck with me, this idea of that we do have those reefs in our lives, you know, that we have these situations or people that we just can't get over, you know, no matter how hard we try. Um, so that, and then, and then the other thing that of course stuck for me was the two women, which even though, you know, Owen's relation, Owen and Anne's relationship is so, you know, central to the story for me, what I really thought was even more important was the two women's relationship that, you know, we can have these relationships with men as women, as, you know, heterosexual women, um, we can have relationships with men, but at the end of the day, you know, these relationships that we have with each other, women with each other, you know, what happens to those in certain situations and how those sometimes maybe need to be worked on, you know, more than just that other relationship. Friendships, friendships, you know, sometimes need to, to be more important than those things. And so there's this, you know, they're trying, you know, Sophie and Anne, there's this rapprochement that tries to occur that kind of fails, <laughs> but at least there's an attempt there to kind of find something, you know, some kind of compassion between each other, some kind of understanding to each other's experience. Um, we have a question here from Melissa asking about the car wash sequence. Uh, yes. Can you talk a little bit about, um, where that came from and Helene uh, also, maybe you can talk about what was that like to film for you? <laughs> Do you want to go first? Uh, well, yeah, you tell, you tell <laughs> the fun stuff. I'll tell the more, uh, um, so, the, car, so um, the car wash scene was always, um, you know, for me, it was always there from the minute I kind of built in the car into the theme and kind of, you know, the symbolism of the car. I said, I've never seen a car wash scene where the window opens. And I found one finally, but it wasn't done the way I would have, mm -hmm. the way we did it in the way, but it was, it hadn't been done yet. And I always have, you know, that's part of my little filmmaker side, which is everyone filmmaker has, which is trying to shoot something that's never been shot and do it the way you want to do it. So, um, so it's always been there and, and the crew put me through hell, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, the crew put me through, you know, hell. Yeah. Like, you're gonna ruin the camera. How are we gonna get insurance? They wanted me to film them telling, you know, explaining. They wanted me to literally film them. They wanted me to film them saying that it wasn't their fault that the camera's ruined in case when the camera got ruined it, to make sure. 
I went through hell. Uh -huh, you know, uh -huh. I mean, it was my witness man. Hell they put me through. Through the right. directors. Jesus. So yeah, <laughs> so I went through hell and thank God for Helene's chutzpah because Helene was like, we're going to do this and we're going to yeah, use I my car. Up to when we were going to do it, they kept saying we couldn't do it. I'm like, we're not going to not do it. We have to do it. And so what we did great. prior to doing it, we went and went to this place to drove through on our own. We did our own car wash. We used Helene's own personal car. In my car. Oh, yeah. And I was like, oh, how wet can it really get? And we got plastic bags and put it all over ourselves and all over everything. We just put garbage bags in the whole car. And then we did it. And we were like, it's not that bad. Like, it isn't that bad. bad. <laughs> you know, but we did it once without. And we're like, this is not so bad. Right? Well, and then the day, I think even on the day they were trying to not do it. Oh, it yeah, yeah, yeah. Quite yeah. really problematic. And everyone was very upset. They had plexiglass and like, you know, they had like, you know, you know these guys, these crew guys, they're like, yes. okay, we're going to get out the and light. In the end, you know, I like, and didn't, didn't we end up using my car? We did and use your car. Of course. Yeah. We used your car again. <laughs> yeah. We shot it in your car. Yes, and, inside. car. and if you look closely, the actually the interior cars and different interior because the, the shot I ended up taking is we did the car wash scene three times we shot mm -hmm. twice inside and then once through the window right. and and it, and so at one point we had it covered to look like the real car but then through the car wash scene the kind of plastic tape started like flapping off <laughs> and so I actually have that shot like there's like this she's like all into the scene and there's like it's right behind her and I'm like, yeah, so we couldn't yeah. use that shot. But but so my, good reason. my car, because they literally wouldn't let us use the car. And it was just like, we're gonna do it anyway. And I thought, uh, my memory is we only did it twice on the day. My hair got too wet. We had to, you know, the second time. Yeah, and I went back and did it a third time through the window. I see, I see, yes. Mm -hmm. And so we did it twice, once with my hair perfect and the next one, not so much, but you know, somewhere between those. Uh, we got the whole thing. It was cr it was crazy, but it was. It was and we had to buy the tickets. The funniest thing was me going to buy the tickets because we weren't even allowed to like park. Like all of the trucks couldn't park, in the, and we got into so much trouble because we had parked our trucks in the in the gas station, and so that everyone had to leave the gas station. And so I had to run back buy the tickets. I was like, "Can I have three car wash tickets, please?" They were like, "Yeah, they were." Oh, they were by the end, and just had to get out of there. But when we, we were done, we needed to leave, and they weren't. Yeah. So we just kept going around like, hi. So, yeah, it's crazy. Speaking, speaking of the car wash scene, it's got such rich, layered, textured sound design. We actually have a question from our audience member, Joy, about how you approach the sound design to this film, because it is really quite innovative throughout. And what was that like navigating on your part, Vanya, as the director? Um, psychological realism, which extends just to expand on the question, from the script into the form of the film. Yeah, I mean, we worked, oddly enough, we were working like right um, at the beginning of COVID. We were kind of in that whole COVID zone for sound. Um, so it was it was quite something. Um, but we were like going to record sounds at the gym and we were like, should we wear a mask? Like it was just the beginning. We we're like, people are wearing masks, I hear. People are cleaning their hands, I hear. So we were, you know, it was like that kind of moment. So we were going into the gym, like, should we clean? Like, it was, just, it was, really, it was like right at that turning point. Um, um, but Andreas and I, yeah, we did a lot of, ja actually Jackie, one of the editors is also a sound editor. And so early on um, in the editing room, Jackie, we, we, we were trying to get the cut done and Jackie would just spend all, she's a brilliant filmmaker in her own right. And Jackie knows. Um, she does these experimental documentaries. Her films are beautiful. Um, she has an, one coming out soon. I can't wait. Um, and she would just be in the editing room and she'd spend all this time on the sound. And I'd be like, hey, but we got it. We got to get to the image because uh, we had like, you know, our deadline. And so she was already starting to create something based on things we had talked about. Um, and so that just kind of carried through with Andreas. And she and Andreas had worked together. Andreas is the, the sound designer. They had worked together already. Um, so they kind of, you know, could just kind of do their thing in a way, like early on, they kind of knew their sensibilities together. It worked really, really well. And so we just kept pushing like, you know, the water theme that I really wanted in there. Um, you know, I wanted the sound to just really be able to enter into Anne's headspace at times, like at the dinner scene with the opera and 
um, you know, there's just moments where, um, yeah, I just wanted the sound to take precedence over, over image almost. Um, and then of course, Das Owls who composed like a beautiful, beautiful score um, and soundtrack. Um, and so kind of just, you know, working with them to build around that. So it was just, you know, it was, you know, the creative process is a crazy kind of unconscious process because you're just kind of creating and, you know, you can't really say how these things occur really. It's just, you just go with your, your heart and your instincts and, and it's certainly the sound is complemented by a very intimate shooting style throughout as well. And, you know, the shallow depth of field and the tighter framing and the nuance of that. So even though you do let the sound shine, it very much is an aesthetically gorgeous film and just every composition is really powerful. So um, I'm a bit of a formalist myself. So I'm always really interested in that conversation of content and form coming together. Um, we have a question here from John for the actors. Can you guys talk a little bit about, I mean, it's a, it's a film with a lot of challenging and heavy scenes. Um, can you each talk about maybe what the most challenging scene for you guys was, you guys was, was and maybe we can start with Aiden. Oh, okay. Uh, the, the most challenging scene, that's, uh, oh man. That's a that's a crazy question. Uh, There's a lot. <laughs> yeah, like there was, there was there was there's so many layers to like the first scenes with Owen and Helene. There's all these undertones. You don't want to just give it to the audience, you know. And neither would Owen want to just re reveal his true feelings, you know, in front of his mm. his girlfriend or partner at the time, right? So. Um, the, I guess, I, you know what it was? It was the first day. I'd say the first day was the most challenging mm -hmm. because there were some pretty intense, important scenes that just laid the foundation between those two characters. Mm -hmm. And it was the first day f for, I th was it just me or was it both of us? I can't remember, but it was the oh, first <laughs> for the both of us. And so that first day of all of the, the, the cottage scenes, that was that was that was heavy. It was very heavy, you know, um, because we had to jump like right into those moments that just put that foundation down for the whole story, right? Um, so I, f I felt like it was the, that day. Every scene in that first day was 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 a lot of work, but I mean, challenging, but like really fucking. Pardon me. Really, really awesome. Like, yeah. really but no, it was a challenging but it was good <laughs> and Helene for you I find yeah challenging is an interesting question you get asked as an actor like what was the hardest part and the hilarious thing is often what people perceive as the hardest thing like oh the most emotional scene that you know those things are not the hardest part the hardest part will be something else like you know something very technically difficult which isn't as sexy sounding you know but that's often the case mm -hmm. um the most challenging probably moment there was for me at times was uh emotions i remember when we were shooting this scene where i dropped off uh, my daughter uh so it was you know and it was toward the end i think toward the end of shooting too and so we've been shooting all of this very emotional stuff and you do get you know um it, it, you know triggered by a lot of stuff that you're shooting with mm -hmm. you i'm not always conscious of it as i'm shooting and then when we shot that, the direction was that well, I, it wasn't highly, well, visually emotional. I wasn't sobbing. I wasn't, you know, that's Talk not- about when you give your daughter over in the end, right? You yeah. Talk. You know, the choice was made that it wasn't highly emotional. I wasn't in a highly emotional state giving her up. And then we, and so we had to shoot it over and over. And the, the problem was, is that I was in a highly emotional state so that, so that for me as an actor, I'm getting into the truth of that moment. Of course, it's a highly emotional state, but that's, but she wasn't showing it. And so it's just a very pent, it's a horribly pent up moment that I had to kind of work through. I remember like being a total wreck and having to sob for some time. Like I've never had that experience. So that was highly challenging, but none of it was on screen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was just very challenging to to physically do as a human like uh, it just really messed me up so there's yeah. that but but other than that like you know challenging uh was it you know really so much was challenging just 
purely because we were doing it so fast and and because uh, so very intense you know on and off intense yeah intensity. so there was a lot that was challenging the scenes that i had with uh charlotte um screaming on the bed and you know sort of felt a little bit like mental breaks where it was very challenging as an actor it was like you know i still watching the film just before this i still don't know how i mean helene basically shot was like shooting every single day like she was on set every day and every day was like basically being like just nervous wreck like you know and she had her days off and she was just like Ugh. And then she'd kind of come back and she'd be like, okay. yeah. you know, it was amazing. You know, Helene, like that she held and she was, you know, Helene held it, man. Like until the very end, Helene was in there. And every day she came in just like, here we go again, nervous wreck, you know, and you never talked about it and you never, you know, and, and I think because you didn't talk about it, that's the power on the screen because you just kind of, you were surviving as an actor and like right. Anne, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah, and I think that's where the power yeah. of the performance comes from. Is that you were both survival mode. <laughs> <laughs> you channeled it into the work. Yeah, because it was such a short period of time. You know, we only had nine yeah. days of shooting. You know, so. Wow. Yeah. Speaking um, of time, we are approaching uh, being out of time on our end. But I'd love to just wrap up with asking you each if you could just speak a little bit to what is next for either the film or yourselves and where we can follow any upcoming projects? Well, I, I can't speak to what's next with, next with the film. Hopefully the film goes on to, you know, when we're not in lockdown for the rest of our lives, maybe the film will, will get to see it on a big screen again or something like that, that'd be awesome. Um, I, I, but I'm super busy, which is crazy considering everything, but I am once again going into, uh, production for Murdoch, although um, that's not official and I don't know when it's happening. But uh, <laughs> yes, so I'll be kind of busy with that again, which is a blessing just to be busy. But other than that, I'm trying to hustle my own projects, but everything has been very difficult in this time. That's all mm -hmm. I can say. It's like nothing moves very fast, but mm -hmm. it's with me. <laughs> and, uh, Aiden? Uh, with the movie, I, uh, same. I mean, hopefully, it, it, you know, it, it move, keeps on moving, builds more of an audience, or, or creates a, you know, a, a spark or a wave kind of thing. Um, you know, maybe get some awards because you two deserve them. I think, uh, you know, that's what I would love to see with the movie. Um, as for uh, myself, uh, I mean, I got a, a few different things that I'm attached to that, uh, you know, the current state of uh, the world has kind of made it complicated. So it's kind of a waiting, waiting game, but uh, you can, you know, just, you know, look on my Facebook or, or my YouTube or even Google my name, actually, it's, and then it, 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 it should show up if those projects, uh, um, you know, uh, end up happening, you know, despite the, the cr craziness that, uh, it did, that it is, uh, mm -hmm. for many of us in, in, the, in the world. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. And Vanya, what's, what's next for the film? What's next for you? Um, well, for the film, we're just waiting to hear back from, you know, festivals and, uh, you know, hopefully we'll be releasing it in the fall, hopefully in theaters, hopefully. Um, and I'm just working on a new script right now. So I'm just submitting for grants right now, which is fun, fun. And finishing my tax credit applications for this uh -huh. year. <laughs> so that Amazing. keeps me busy. So yeah. Great. Yeah. Well, I wish we had more time. We did have some audience questions that we didn't get to, but it was so great to hear from all of you. Thank you so much. I also want to thank our audiences at home for watching and remind you that the Canadian Film Fest is on until April 18th. There are lots more terrific films and industry programming events happening over the coming weeks. So please keep an eye on the Can Canadian Film Fest Facebook page and website, which is www.canfilmfest.ca for more great films and events. And thank you so much again for joining us. And thanks to the film team. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, guys. Bye.